Welcome back to our study of the early church history, as well as the separation that occurred between Christianity and Judaism. In part one of this teaching, we have already addressed a few important topics. And I really encourage you to watch part one first before continuing into this teaching, because this teaching was designed as a series to be watched in order with part one first and then part two, this teaching. In part one, we addressed some of the following topics, the early church foundations and the history, how there was persecution of Jewish people as well as Christians, the separation of places of worship, the inclusion of the Gentiles against Jewish thought, the westernized appearance of Jesus, the theological impacts of the separation between Christianity and Judaism. And we talked about anti-Semitism. We will now continue where we left off. We spoke about how there were there's this revolution that occurred in Christian culture where the image of who Jesus was and the identity of who he was was stripped from his, his original Jewish identity and heritage. And he was painted with a new westernized version, a character, a Jesus that teaches things contrary to what the true Yeshua taught. You see, we addressed how the Jewish people have rejected Messiah. And one of the main reasons of the rejection is because the Jesus portrayed to them by Christianity has in many cases been a Jesus that is lawless, teaches the laws abolished and doesn't even look like a Jew, nor has a Jewish heritage. Part of the reason of why this occurred more and more is anti-Semitism. Much like today, back then, 2000 years ago, and even before and throughout the ages, there has been anti-Semitism, a hatred for Jewish people. And so this hatred was also within Christianity and even among some of the church fathers of the Christian faith. This was one of the contributors to the separation between Judaism and Christianity. Let's read a few of the quotes from some of Christianity's church fathers. Pope Innocent III wrote, Crucifiers of Christ ought to be held in continual subjection. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote, It would be illicit, according to custom, to hold the Jews in perpetual servitude, because of their crime. Pope Leo said, let the gospel be preached to them. And if they remain obstinate, let them be expelled. Saint Vincent Ferrer wrote, one who dies a Jew will be damned. Some church fathers and some in Christianity in the earlier days of the faith had this anti-Semitism because they believed that the Jews were responsible for the killing of Jesus. We already discussed in part one how this is not really giving the full picture. And really to just say that the Jews were responsible is a lie. And so we cannot say that all Jews ought to be hated or expelled or, or for whatever reason. And in fact, it would be even if uh, Jewish people reject the Messiah, that would not be a reason to expel them out of a country either. Right. You see, the writings that we are reading here shows a level of hatred towards Jewish people that even in their if, if there is a true denial of the true Messiah in their eyes, if they go out and like the Pharisees deny him. That does not warrant for them to be for us to persecute Jewish people. Messiah called us to love them. Saint Vincent Ferrer said the one who dies a Jew will be damned. This is again not true. It's unbiblical to say or think such a thing. It is not based off whether you're a Jew or not. 
that determines whether you will be damned to eternal punishment of some sort. No, it's when we deny Christ and all people, whether they're Jewish or not, whether they're Jewish has nothing to do with whether someone inherits salvation. It does not mean they do not inherit it. And it does not mean they do just like being an Asian or being uh, an American does not mean anything regarding salvation or being a black or a white person does not mean anything regarding our salvation. It is when we die in our sins without the crucified Messiah having holding on to him to be saved. That's when we die without him and when we will be died, dying as separate from God. And so to say to die as a Jew, you will be damned. That is horrific. And brothers, sisters, here's the thing. We often in Christianity, even today, some like to quote church fathers as defense for many things. And surely there have been good things that church fathers have done. Please understand that why I am I am reading some horrible things today. These are quotes that I am taking of some of the worst things that have been said by certain church fathers. And this is not uh, a mirror of all of the church fathers of the faith. There were other people who weren't anti-Semitic. But just because someone is a church father does not mean that their word is law or scripture. I think that is the point that I'm trying to make here. And I think that that is important for us all to keep in mind. Saint Gregory of Nyssa said Jews are slayers of the Lord, murderers of the prophets, enemies and haters of God, adversaries of grace, enemies of their father's faith, advocates of the devil, a broad of viper, slanderers, scoffers, men of darkened minds, the leaven of Pharisees, a congregation of demons, sinners, wicked men, haters of goodness. Our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, he called certain Pharisees a brood of vipers. And so this church father found it appropriate to take that term and and apply this to Jewish people as a whole. But even the Messiah himself was a Jew. His followers and all the first church leaders, the 12 apostles were all Jews. You see, our Messiah applied a rebuke such as saying a brood of vipers to a very certain group, the Pharisees, but also not all the Pharisees, he, because there were Pharisees such as Paul, Paul, who wrote most of our New Testament, identified himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees. And so Yeshua was very specific. He was speaking to people face to face who identified at that moment as Pharisees, and he said, you, you guys have leaven, you, the leaven of the Pharisees, you are a brood of vipers, etc. But he was speaking to certain people. He was not speaking to all of Judaism, all of the Jews or 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 all of the Pharisees even. You see, but if we go and we paint it all for bro stroke like that, that is not the heart of the Messiah. That is a wicked and prideful heart that lacks all discernment. Other anti-Semites include Martin Luther, John Calvin, Peter, the Venerable. Then we also have the Roman Catholics who in their anti-Semitism exiled Jewish people from their countries and even murdered and killed Jews who refused to accept Jesus. Brothers and sisters, you need to understand that a Jewish a, a boy who grows up Orthodox and Orthodox Judaism is often taught about the history of the Jewish people. And this is part of their history that the Christians, more specifically, the Roman Catholics, but nevertheless, Christians killed and murdered Jewish people. Why would Jewish people want a Jesus? Why would they want to worship the one that those Romans worship? They did it in the name of Jesus. Why would any Jew want to accept Jesus? 
if if you or me, if you if you're not a Jewish Jewish person, but you grew up as one and you were taught these things, it would be very difficult to see the Messiah. And it's not the Messiah. It's not the Messiah's fault. It's not even that Jewish boy's fault. It's not because that boy had a, a good perception of who Jesus was and then denied him. No, he had no real idea of who Jesus was. He had only what has been done against his heritage by people in the name of Jesus. And so it is our responsibility to understand these things because it is the fault, the fault of Christianity in many cases for Jewish people wanting nothing to do with the Messiah who came for the Jew first. And for that, we ought to repent towards our Jewish brothers and sisters. For that, we ought to repair the breach and do everything we can in our lives to start walking like the Messiah actually did, to learn who he really was, a Jew, and to provoke our Jewish brothers and sisters to jealousy by manifesting the beauty of their true Messiah to them. A Jewish Messiah who kept the Sabbath, who ate clean food, who kept the biblical feast days, who wore tzitzits, who was inside and out a Jewish person, who rejected certain Jewish customs who were against, that were against the law of God. Of course, we do not need to compromise, but we do need to get back to basics, stop being prideful and allow ourselves to be taught who our Messiah was. And, and we can do well to start by learning the things he learned. And that is the Torah and the prophets, that book, that thing we call the Old Testament that many of our churches have abandoned. Yes, we say we believe in it, but do we teach from it? Do we study it deeply? Do we really understand what it says and do we do what it says? If not, why would any Jewish person look to us? Because in their mind, they understand that the Bible, the Torah and the prophets teaches that if anyone comes to teach against the law of God, if everyone comes and he does not live out the law of God, yet he says something like there is a Messiah here or there, they will not listen. In fact, the Bible teaches them to not listen because that man is a false prophet, because only those who are true prophets, those who are true followers of God will follow what the law says, be obedient and never teach against it. Just like the Messiah said, for whoever does that will be called least in the kingdom of heaven in Matthew five. It's time for us to start there, start doing that. So we can be aligned to our Jewish brothers and sisters. But not only that, it doesn't just end with speaking about the law or doing things in obedience to the father, trying to walk like Yeshua, which is important for any follower and disciple of Yeshua to do. But it's also going to the next level of walking in the spirit, casting out demons, healing the sick, doing miracles in his name, seeking to be filled with his spirit, it's not taking no for an answer when it comes to seeing the book of Acts manifest in your life, because the Great Commission, when Yeshua gave it to his disciples, they were instructed to first go to Jewish people, as we discussed. So when we do it, but we do not seek to to reach the Jew, do we not fail part of the Great Commission, which was first given? to reach the Jewish people, not just Jewish people, but first to the Jew. Just some things to think about. In the writings of some of the church fathers from the second century around onwards, we also start seeing something called replacement theology come up in their writings. Replacement theology is the belief that the church has now replaced Israel that the promises made out to Israel, it no longer applies to Israel, but now only applies to the church. Is this true and is this biblical? We see, for example, that in the epistle of Barnabas, chapter four or six to seven, take heed to yourselves and be not like some piling up your sins and saying that the covenant is theirs as well as ours. It is ours but they lost it completely. 
just after Moses received it. In the Epistle of Barnabas, it's written that they, the Jewish people, lost it completely and it is now for us. Paul, the apostle, disagrees. He says the following in Romans 11, verse 11. So I ask, did they, the Jewish people, stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Paul says that he is hoping for the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. And in fact, he says that the, one of the purposes, one of the purposes of the Gentiles, non-Jewish people receiving the gospel is to make Israel jealous. Now, if God, if Israel lost it completely, like we read in the Epistle of Barnabas, that Israel is now far off and forever gone and God does not want them anymore. Why does Paul say we are to provoke them to jealousy? Why is that one of the purposes that you and me have come to faith? Because he said for the purpose of provoking Israel to jealousy. You see, brothers and sisters, some things that have been said and taught in Christianity is wrong and evil. Just like that boy when in high school, when I was uh, coming out of class and he said, the Jewish people, they have lost God. They have been forsaken by God. Lies. We have inherited lies and we have taught our children these lies because in Romans, Paul said the opposite. How much more blessing will there be upon the world with the full inclusion of the Jewish people to the gospel? And the origin of Alexandria in 185 to 254 AD. This is a respected writer and teacher who contributed to the early formation of Christian doctrines. And he says this, We may thus assert in utter confidence that the Jews will not return to their earlier situation, for they have committed the most abominable of crimes in forming this conspiracy against the Savior of the human race. Hence, the city where Jesus suffered was necessarily destroyed. The Jewish nation driven from its country and another people called by God to the blessed election. Oregon said that they will not return to their earlier situation and that another people have been called to this blessed election instead of the Jewish people. Again, promoting replacement theology, that the church has totally replaced Israel and Israel has no more place in God's plan. Again, we establish that this is a lie. It's not true. Paul said the opposite. We read that we, if you consider yourself a non-Jew, you were grafted into Israel. That is the olive tree. And it is also true that some branches were broken off. Those who saw who the Messiah was in his true form and who rejected him were broken off from that olive tree. But Paul continues to say that they can be grafted back in. In contradiction to the some of these church fathers who are anti-Semitic who stated that they cannot and that they have lost their inheritance and their promises. We read in Romans 11 verse 19, then you will say, branches were broken off so that I may be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Here's what we need to see, brothers and sisters. We sometimes say, like these church fathers, some of us may have thought they were broken off, so we may be grafted in. It's true that they were broken off, but beware, is what Paul says, because it is because of pride. And you, stating this, have the same pride that caused them to be broken off in the first place. Let me demonstrate what I mean by that. In Matthew 3 verse 9, Jesus addresses 
a few Jewish people who believe that because Abraham is the, their father natively, that they are fine and saved through that lineage. But Jesus tells them, do not think that that is what is going to save you and you can continue in your sin and pride. You see, they had pride thinking that they can do what they want. They will not lose favor with God because Abraham is their father. He says, said it in Matthew 3 verse 9. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. You see, for these Jewish people that Jesus was speaking to, Abraham was like their refuge for sin. They would wanted to continue in their sin, but then they covered under Abraham and said, well, he is our father. We can take safety under that. And then Jesus said, don't think that that's going to help you. I can raise sons from these stones as well. That isn't that that though, what people often do, even in Christianity today, when we say that, oh, you know, we we have the church. We are the church. We are the chosen people. We are special now. And so we take refuge under that and we take pride in that as being what gives us favoritism to God. And that is what replacement theology is. It is stating that we are so special as the church that we can replace Israel. But God, just like these Jewish people who Jesus was speaking to, took refuge under Abraham for their sin. We take refuge under the church and our identity as the church for our sin. It's no different, really. We have the same pride that those who were ripped out of the tree had too. In Romans 11, verse 23, we read, and even they, the Jewish people, If they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. Paul continues in Romans 11 verse 18 and says, Do not be arrogant towards the branches, the Jews. By the time of the Holocaust during World War II, many theologians started rejecting replacement theology at a scale like never before. Because they started recognizing the effects of replacement theology upon Christianity and the church. Because a lot of what happened in the Holocaust was done in the name of Jesus yet again. And churches within Germany approved of the practice, citing replacement theology that the church replaced Israel and that God has forsaken the Jews and hates the Jews. A lie. But yet now many after these atrocities were done, It was identified by these scholars that the root of replacement theology in many cases is simple anti-Semitism, a hatred for Jewish people and the Jewish bloodline, just like Hitler and the German church in World War II had. Furthermore, we would like to now move on and talk a little. We've talked a lot about the church fathers now. We talked about anti-Semitism within Christianity. But I would like to also talk about some lies that have been spread within Judaism about Yeshua. Lies within Judaism regarding Yeshua are spread for various reasons. However, the top two reasons are likely that the leaders within Orthodox Judaism, at least some of them, much like in the first century, have a simple hatred for Yeshua and his doctrines and ideologies because they their positions are undermined by some of what Yeshua taught. And so just like certain Pharisees came against Yeshua in the first century, today we have the same thing. Certain Pharisees, if you will, coming against Yeshua within Judaism and usually within the leadership And because the leadership has such great authority within Israel and over the Jewish people, they easily spread lies and the people trust the leaders. And so it's easy for the people, the Jewish people to then believe some of these lies 
taught to them by the Jewish leaders. However, some of the lies that the Jewish leaders believe uh, or that the people believe is not be simply because they don't like Jesus, but sometimes it's because of what Christianity has taught them. And that is the fault of Christianity in those cases. Because some t- a lot of these lies are based off how Christianity again has portrayed Jesus, his identity and his teachings. Some of which is not who the true, what Yeshua really taught when he was here in his ministry. Some of these lies, for example, are that Jesus followers are murderers of Jews. That Jesus only appears in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is is the God of Christianity. And Jesus began a new religion called Christianity. And that Jesus taught against the law of Moses. Let's go through each of these quickly. Jesus followers or murderers of Jews. Well, this is partly true because in Catholicism throughout the ages and many times in the name of Jesus, Jews have been murdered. However, to paint this with a broad brush as all of Christianity, all of Christians and that all of the Christians who did these things were even true Christians is a stretch. True believers and followers of the Christ would never murder a Jew or persecute a Jew because of his or her beliefs. We are not called to persecute people who do not believe in the Messiah. We are called to be a light to them. That is what the Messiah taught. So if any person does these things, they are not actually a true Christian and modeling Christ accurately. So it would not be fair to judge the Christ, the Messiah, the Mashiach, based off what these Christians have done in his name. Secondly, under the next lie is that Jesus only appears in the New Testament. Of course, this is a lie that's sometimes taught by some of the rabbinic rabbis in Orthodox Judaism. However, this is far from true. We read in many of the prophets about um, the Messiah and his and things that he really went through in his ministry on earth. And so I would really encourage you to look into that because there is a lot, It is amazing how the Torah in detail talks about him. In fact, it is when you start seeing it is quite difficult to unsee because the entire every Torah portion is full of the Messiah and hints towards the Messiah over and over and over again to the things he actually did when he was here within his earthly ministry. The next lie is that Jesus Christ is the God of Christianity. Within Judaism, this is seen and this is similar to what Marcion taught as we discussed in part one of this teaching. He taught that the God of Christianity or the God of the New Testament, if you will, is different from the God of the Old Testament or the God of the Torah. This is not true because there is unity between the um, Torah and prophets as well as the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament never contradicts the Torah and prophets ever. It only serves to provide more revelation on with that which was given in the beginning. And it does an amazing job at that. That's what the Messiah said. He came to fulfill, bring greater meaning to the law and the prophets. The next lie we want to address quickly is that Jesus began a new religion called Christianity. He did not. Jesus came to continue what his father started, to continue in the promises, to continue in the teachings of the Torah and the prophets. And so he did not come to throw that out and start something new. We should accept all things written and the Torah and the prophets, like our Messiah did, like Paul did, like the 12 apostles did, and like the early church did. And the last lie that we can quickly address is that Jesus taught against the law of Moses. He never did. However, looking at some of Christianity, we can truly understand why many Jews believe this. Much of Christianity has 
thrown out the law of Moses as inapplicable and not for them, even throwing out the Ten Commandments given through Moses at Mount Sinai. And so if we look at some of Jesus' followers, it could be easy for any Jewish person to think that that's what Jesus taught. However, it's far from what he taught. As we established in the part one of this teaching as well, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said the opposite, that he did not come to abolish it or come against it, and anyone who teaches that will be least in the kingdom of heaven. And that we must be obedient, not for salvation, because our works cannot save us, but because we are saved and because we love him. And that because our obedience is a sign of our love for him. Just like if he asks you to do something, you're going to do it because you love him. And so in the same way, if he comes and he asks us to keep the Ten Commandments, we would do so because we love him. We know that those things do not save us. But being obedient is evidence of our faith. It shows us that our faith is genuine and not just um, words without action. So the true Messiah never taught against the law or the prophets. He only came to repeat it and to teach us more about how to keep it the way God always intended such as regarding the Sabbath, where he taught that the Sabbath was made for man and man not made for the Sabbath. Within the first century, for example, people were being burdened sometimes by the religious leaders and they were being burdened with man-made teaching and weights that was hard to bear. And the Sabbath became a burden and a curse instead of a blessing. Yeshua came and he restored it as a blessing to his people, teaching more accurately that it was made for us to bless us, that he is the Lord of the Sabbath and that we can find rest in him. And every t- week when we physically rest from our labors, as he instructs us to, we'll find blessing in that. And even more so when we understand uh, and think on what he has done for us when we rest. This is just one example of the many beautiful things that he came to teach regarding the law. He certainly did not abolish it or throw it out, only came to bring more edification regarding it. To guide us closer to the true intents of our Father, that intent that brings life and blessing upon our lives, and for us to and how and teaching us how to be a light to people around us. It is also noteworthy for us to understand that the Jewish people as a culture is a people that is incredibly cultured and uh, a, a kind of people that easily um, close themselves off from other people. And partly this is because of their persecution that has been going on through the ages. But it also means that they are easily ostracized and easily persecuted within their families and friends if they were to come to the Messiah. They are even taught that anyone who accepts Jesus, Yeshua, is not even a Jew anymore. That they lose their Jewish identity when doing so. This, of course, is not true. However, we need to understand that this persecution exists. And so it is is incredibly difficult for Jewish people who grow up in a Jewish culture to accept the Messiah because of all these cultural boundaries. But as one of my friends always say, accepting Jesus was the most Jewish thing that he had ever done. Saying that as a Jew means a lot, and it's true because he is, Yeshua is, the Jewish Messiah. So how can the followers of Yeshua the Messiah be a light to our Jewish brothers and sisters who have not seen the Messiah yet? This is one of the biggest points in this teaching and the objectives of this. I want you to really have perspective on their position and why the Jewish people are in the position they're in. You see, while they may seem hard to reach, the solution is pretty simple. And it won't just be good for them. It would be good for ourselves as well as the whole world. One of the points that we can apply is that we simply need to return what has been lost within Christianity and the intent of the Messiah within his body as a whole. And that is to simply 
do what he did. As simple as that sounds, unfortunately, in many denominations, much of that has been abandoned. He has called us to walk like he did in obedience to his father's instructions, to not teach against it, for then we will be least in the kingdom, as he said. Unfortunately, though, because of the anti-Semitism and other reasons that we've discussed in this teaching, many church fathers from the second century onwards started departing from certain of the commandments that made the Messiah who he was and made people outwardly be a witness of being a believer. You see, we talked about how persecution caused believers to give up some of the instructions. And so similarly, the instructions that were sometimes given up along the way over the past 2000 years through whichever means and by whichever authorities are the very instructions that are the ones that when as when we as believers put them on are ones that shine to the world the perspective of who the Messiah really is. For example, the Sabbath day. People who are non-Jews keeping the Sabbath day, just like their Messiah did, would be an incredible light and witness to the Jewish people who cherish and understand the value of the Sabbath because they would then understand and see, oh, this Messiah actually teaches that the Sabbath is important. And this is in connection with their understanding that the Messiah would do that. Instead of throwing it out or teaching it's not important. Similarly, uh, the return to the biblical feast days, pass of the celebration of Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits and Pentecost and the feast of trumpets and the feast of tabernacles, the day of atonement, celebrating the biblical feast days as God has given it to be perpetual forever, to never pass away. When we celebrate these, which are often seen as Jewish feasts, and while the Jewish people are to keep them, they are not just for the Jewish people. They're God's feasts, as he said in the book of Leviticus. These are my feasts, and they're for all who would like to follow him, including people who consider themselves Christians or just followers of the Messiah. There's great value in them. They're not all fulfilled yet. They're not all passed like uh, they're not passed away. And uh, continuing on, you know, there are others too, other things that we have lost along the way. Like returning to eating our bacon and pork and pepperoni pizzas. Some things need to be given up because they're not the kind of things our Messiah did. It's nothing that not the kind of things that his apostles did. And it's not the kind of things that the early church would do. In fact, one of the dietary instructions given to Gentile believers was to not eat blood. Now, today that seems weird, but in the first century, there were Gentile pagans who had a practice of eating blood. And that's why they told them to not eat blood. See, that's a dietary instruction. Today, we have a tendency to eat unclean food like pork. God is just as concerned about us not eating pork as he is about us not eating blood or things strangled. Let me explain to you. I understand that you may have questions at this point. I understand you may ask, well, didn't wh wh why are Christians? Are you saying Christians are to keep the law? Are you saying that? We are saved. No, we're not saved by the law. But we are to be obedient. I know that Acts 15 often comes to mind where the Jerusalem Council came together about this very issue, about whether we should be Gentiles, that is people who aren't Jews, who are pagans, who are now coming to the faith, whether they should keep anything that has a resemblance of being a Jewish custom. Let me clarify and make sure that everyone understands that I am not telling us or anyone that we should be returning to Jewish customs that are rabbinic in nature that are not in the Bible. 
The Messiah never taught that. The disciples, the apostles, no one, no one taught that. But they did teach the keeping of what is written in the Torah and the prophets. In Acts 15, it is important for us to read from the first verse because in the first verse, the accusation is brought. And then we can clearly see what this is about. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 19, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. In the first verse of Acts 15, the context is very clear that men came in saying that it is necessary for non-Jews who believe in Jesus now to be circumcised in accordance with the custom of Moses. And they have to do this in order to be saved. Well, this is not what the Bible teaches, not even in our Old Testament. The Torah and the prophets does it teach that a circumcision saves anyone. So right off the bat, these uh, Pharisees who brought this, they were teaching something unbiblical in the first place. This was not something that Jesus came to change because it was never right. And so when the uh, apostles replied, they were replying to what do people need to do in order to be saved and they reply that they need to do one thing to be saved and that's to believe in the Messiah. And then they, and they said that, wow, these people were filled with the spirit, like people who are non Gentiles got filled with the spirit, despite not being circumcised or anything. And then they said, but there are some things that they need to do. And they laid out a few of the instructions of the Torah that were seen as essential. For example, they said that we should, they should abstain from things polluted by idols, sexual morality, things strangled and from blood. You cannot serve the Messiah while serving an idol. You see, that's the problem, right? So, but that is an instruction from the Torah, from the commandments, the law, do not worship either idols. And they went on and said, you have to stop with sexual immorality. You cannot commit sexual immorality while trying to worship the Messiah, the God of Israel, etc., etc. Why were they lifting these things out, these specific things that these Gentiles, these pagans coming into the faith now need to do? Because these were the things they were struggling with. They were eating blood. They were stuck in sexual immorality. They were worshiping other idols and things of the such. And so these were things essential for them to leave to inherit salvation because we are saved by faith, but we must repent of our sin our breaking of the law. If we want to go and have true faith, because that's what true faith will produce repentance. We're not saved by our works, but faith without works is dead. And so what is most the most important verse in this whole chapter is verse 21 where he says, for from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. They are directing the people to the synagogue where Moses is read every Sabbath. They're basically saying, let's give them these basic things in order to get saved. And then they will go to the synagogue every Sabbath where the Torah is studied exhortations given regarding it, and these people will get the rest in there and they will be able to grow step by step after they take these first baby steps into the faith. You see, brothers and sisters, verses like Acts 15 were often used to say that we don't have to do anything. We just need to accept Jesus, but we don't have to uh, look to walk like he did because Jesus did many things, including keeping the Sabbath, which many of us have abandoned because we have been taught that 
we don't need to do that, even though he did. Brothers and sisters, it's important for us to start looking back to what our Messiah really looked like and start imitating who he really was. If you have more questions regarding the Jerusalem Council, have a look at our video called The Jerusalem Council Is the Law Abolished for Gentiles? I want to read to you a historical document called The Apostolic Constitutions. This is a collection of church laws from the second to third century that were written down. I want to show you what it says. Consider the manifold workmanship of God, which received its beginning through Christ. Thou shalt observe the Sabbath on account of him who ceased from his work of creation, but ceased not from his work of providence. It is a rest for meditation of the law, not for idleness of the hands. This is in the Apostolic Constitutions, Book 2, Chapter 36. Just like in Acts 15, at the end, it said they will go to the synagogue on the Sabbath to study the law. This is what is echoed in these apostolic constitutions, these church laws. How on the Sabbath, you go to the synagogue to study the law. That is what it was like even from the second to the third century of the early church. They were Christians, believers who went there to study. And it shouldn't be a shock because there was nothing else except church letters going around. The scriptures were still seen as the Torah and the prophets. So to abandon the study of that would be to almost abandon the faith in of itself. Because they understood that Yeshua was the word that became flesh. And the word as I knew it, the scriptures, was the Torah and the prophets. He came to walk it out perfectly to show them how to live the way God intended them to live. But what happened to the Sabbath in of itself? Well, let's have a look at the fourth century. This is a writing of the fourth century describing what was happening in the early church regarding the Sabbath. In Socrates Scholasticus, he wrote, For though almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries, the Lord's Supper, on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. The Egyptians in the neighborhood of Alexandria and the inhabitants of Tobias hold their religious assemblies on the Sabbath, but do not participate of the mysteries of the manner usual among Christians in general. For after having eaten and satisfied themselves with food of all kinds in the evening, making their offerings, they partake of the mysteries. As you can see, the Sabbath was pretty widely still celebrated, even within the late fourth century. The Sabbath being the seventh day or Saturday as we have it today. However, this would not last very long. What is important to understand is that people kept the Sabbath even into the late 4th century on the seventh day on Sabbath. But there was also many churches who started celebrating the Lord's Day as well. That is Sunday or the first day of the week. They celebrated this as in remembrance of the resurrection of Christ, which is not unbiblical, but it certainly is tradition. Uh, it is not commanded by scripture to do ever, but there's certainly nothing wrong with doing it because there's nothing wrong with remembering what the Lord has done in his resurrection for us. But this is what the practice was. There was a seventh day Sabbath kept, which was understood as the commanded Sabbath. And then there was the Lord's day kept as tradition, and it was as a memorial unto what the Lord had done for them. But this started shifting more and more because some of the leaders within Christianity that were being raised, they had a lot of pagan backgrounds. They had beliefs rooted in paganism sometimes still, and they tried to merge some of their pagan ideas with Christianity. And it was quite convenient 
for the Lord's Day to be falling on Sunday. At the Council of Laodicea in the 4th century, we see a growing distaste for the Sabbath. In Canon 29, we read that Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's Day. And if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. Now, while there was the Sabbath and then the Lord's Day for a long time practiced both by the church, now these leaders in the Christian church started putting in regulations and man-made laws stating that the Lord's Day ought to completely replace the keeping of the Sabbath in accordance to the fourth commandment of God. This was done because they saw the Jews as being the ones who keep the Sabbath and they wanted to be separate from any Jewish association, even to the point of abandoning the biblical commandment of keeping the Sabbath. They even say that anyone who keep the Sabbath, any Christian, any believer who wanted to simply keep that fourth commandment would be anathema from Christ. That would he would that is he would be separate. He would be expelled from Christ and obviously thereby being expelled from the church and fellowship in of itself. This is one of the greatest forms of persecution that started being perpetuated against those believers who weren't even Jews who try to keep the Sabbath day holy. The anti-Semitism within this law is pretty evident because people were instructed to on purpose make sure that they actually work hard on this day, that is the Sabbath, to spite Judaism and to show their distaste for Judaism. This was done out of spite and pride and hatred for Jewish people. But with that, they threw out a biblical commandment. What is also important to understand with this law that that it tells us is that there were many people who were identifying as non-Jews who did in fact keep the Sabbath as the seventh day. Because if there were none, it would be not necessary for them to even make this man-made law or put it in place. Because it was given to the church as a whole. But why would you give an instruction to the church as a whole if no one is doing anything that would need such instruction? The fact of the matter is they were putting this out because there were still a lot of people within the late 4th century that were identifying as Christians and keeping the Sabbath. We see this confirmed as well in the Councils 2693 where Bishop Hephile confirms this by adding, it was also the custom in many provinces of the ancient church to have observed Saturday as the feast of creation. To further spite the Jewish people, these church fathers went ahead and also said that Christians ought to fast on the Sabbath. It is well known that Even within the day of Jesus walking in his earthly ministry and throughout the time ever since, even into the fourth century, the Sabbath was a day of feasting. It was a day when there was a great dinner table made and people came together to fellowship around this table and worship the Lord. But these church fathers didn't want any Christians celebrating this anymore. And instead, they said that everyone has to fast on this seventh day instead. Neander writes, in the Western and especially in the Romish church, where the opposition against Judaism predominated, the custom, on the other hand, grew out of this opposition of observing the Sabbath also as a fast day. As early as the beginning of the third century, the learned Hippolytus was led to write on this controversy between the Eastern and Western Church. As we considered earlier, there were more and more Gentile pagans coming into the faith. And because of this, some of them tried to incorporate their pagan customs into the faith of following the Messiah of Israel. 
One of the classic examples of this is Constantine and his attempts to change God's commandment regarding the Sabbath in 321 AD. We read the following. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may work freely and lawfully continue their pursuits. This is in Schaff's History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, Chapter 75. It was no secret that it was because of Constantine's sun worship religion that this was instituted because it was for the venerable day of the sun. Sunday, as we call it today. That's why most Christian churches still celebrate what they may call the Sabbath on the first day of the week instead of the commanded seventh day on Sunday, because Constantine instituted it to be on Sunday to worship the venerable day of the sun as well, to consider the sun as worship along with the Messiah as worship. In 325 AD, Pope Sylvester officially named Sunday to the Lord's Day. And in 338 AD, Eusebius, the court bishop or close friend of Constantine, wrote in his commentary on the Psalms, All things whatsoever that it was the duty to do on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, we, Constantine, Eusebius, and other bishops, have transferred to the Lord's day, the first day of the week, as more appropriately belonging to it, because it has precedence and, and it is first in its rank and more honorable than the Jewish Sabbath. This is according to Parker John's D, the Sabbath transferred, pages 93 to 94. This court bishop, along with Constantine, were basically part of the early Roman Catholic Church, and they were the ones who started the trend of worshiping the Lord using the Sabbath rather on Sunday with this transfer, as they call it, to Sunday. So anyone who is keeping the Sabbath on Sunday, the first day of the week, instead of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, in and of itself, is they are then submitting themselves under the authority of this Catholic Church. Because it's the Catholic Church who made this change and commanded this. It is not God. The Roman Catholic Church, even to this day, believes that they have the authority to make this transfer. And that anyone who submits to the authority of the Church ought to respect that. Unfortunately, while many would say they do not honor the authority of the Roman Catholic Church today, they still honor the transfer that the Roman Catholic Church did by transferring the Sabbath to the first day of the week. I would like to remind you that Jesus himself said that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. If he is the Lord of the Sabbath, who gives authority to any other church or person to change the Sabbath? Furthermore, God said in the book of Exodus, of all the commandments regarding the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath was the only commandment where he said, remember it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It was not said with any other of the instructions, specifically, remember the commandment. I want to submit to you that God told us to remember the Sabbath day because in all his wisdom, he understood that this would be the very one that would be forgotten by many of God's followers and believers around the world. Today, he's calling us back to the freedom of the Sabbath. It has blessed my life immensely. It's changed many aspects of my walk for the good so well. It's my 24 hour date with Jesus. Time set aside for him. And God is waiting for you on this day too to meet with you and for you to find rest for your soul and the Messiah on this day he has set apart for you to do so on. We can certainly rest every day in the finished work of the cross. But he did not tell us to keep the Sabbath 
physically every day, he told us to keep it on the seventh day. That is what he taught. That is what the Bible teaches. And no one has the authority to change that to any other day. Next, let's speak about the biblical feast days. There is an abundance of evidence that our Messiah kept the biblical feast days. In fact, he had to as part of his role as the Messiah. He was with his disciples celebrating a form of Passover. Furthermore, he was going to visit Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. He celebrated all of the biblical feasts. And his disciples naturally followed in that. And that continued even into the early church. We read one example of this even going as far as into the late 4th century, where a man called John Chrysostom wrote about this. This man was anti-Semitic yet again, and he is complaining about all the Christians around him who are celebrating the biblical feast days. He said the following, The festivals of the pitiful and miserable Jews are soon to march upon us, one after the other, and in quick succession. The feast of trumpets, the feast of tabernacles, the fasts. There are many in our ranks who say they think as we do. Yet some of these are going to watch the festivals, and others will join the Jews in keeping the feasts and observing the fasts. I wish to drive this perverse custom from the church right now. This is John and Chrysostom in Homily 1 in Adversus Judaeus. As you can see, there were Christians around him celebrating these biblical feast days to his own irritation. That's why he wrote this after all. There would be no reason to complain about believers around him celebrating these feasts if no one was doing so. He didn't like it for the same reason that many did not want to keep the Sabbath anymore. For the same reason that many started leaving many of the things that had a kind of Jewish appearance, even if it was simply because the Messiah was Jewish. And God gave biblical commandments that are simply perceived as being Jewish because sometimes the Jewish people are best known for keeping them. And this was the same thing here. John did not like Jewish people. He did not like anything that resembled a Jewish custom. And so for that reason, he wanted to abandon these biblical commandments and he spoke down upon Christians who did not. However, simply having anti-Semitism is not a good reason to abandon God's commandments. We have to do what God said, regardless of what we feel about a people group. In fact, God calls us to love all peoples. But we don't only have to look outside of Scripture and what people wrote regarding this. Even within Scripture, there's an abundance of evidence of feast keeping, even in the first century early church, just as Yeshua was leaving. In fact, the most, arguably one of the most important events to ever happen within the pages of the New Testament would not have taken place if the early church did not celebrate the biblical feast days. In the book of Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the feast of Pentecost. You see, when Jesus told his disciples to go and wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit, he did not tell them to keep the Feast of Pentecost. He did not need to, because they were going to do so. That's what you do if you're a follower of the Messiah and the God of Israel. You keep His Biblical Feast Days, which He said is forever. So, when they all came together, all the peoples, a multitude, a mixed multitude, there was feasting and celebrating of the Lord and the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied and it was amazing. 3,000 received baptism. 
right? But none of this would have happened had no one pitched up to celebrate the feast of Pentecost. And it didn't end there. The feast of Pentecost and the, all the other feasts continued to be celebrated in the early church. We even see Paul the Apostle making large arrangements, traveling over oceans, leaving the people he was visiting to simply be in Jerusalem for the feasts. One example of this is in Acts 20 verse 16. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, so that he would not have to spend time in Asia. For he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. These festivals are not Jewish in that they are only for the Jewish people. They, according to scripture, are God's festivals. We read this in Leviticus 23 too. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. God is the Lord of the Sabbath. God is also the Lord of the feasts. The Sabbath belongs to him. The feasts belong to him. And he calls you to come and join him in celebrating it all on these days, celebrating what he's done on these days. This is there's great freedom in this. I have been celebrating the feast days and the Sabbath for a long time, for years now, way over 10 years. And it has been nothing but a blessing to come and be with my father on the days he told us to meet with him. Especially we can meet with him any day. But these days, he especially told us to keep holy. Everything he does is a reason. And there is great blessing in meeting him on these days. If the keeping of the biblical feast days is a new idea to you as a Christian, I encourage you to watch our short teaching called Why Are Christians Returning to Jewish Festivals? So I know what you may be thinking after watching this teaching. PD, are you saying that 2000 years of Christianity has all gone wrong? Are you saying that all of these great church fathers or great men of God that may be running through your mind right now have made mistakes that seem to be even quite dire? I want to submit to you that if you consider yourself a Protestant, you are admitting by definition that your ancestors have believed in a thousand five hundred years of lies because the Protestant movement only started in around 1517 AD. Thereby, it means they were basically saying we have inherited lies. They were basically saying the Catholic Church have lied to us about some things and we want to change some things. Because we want to be more pure in our beliefs and our faith and our worship and following of the Messiah. So what makes this different? You see, there was a Protestant movement that started just over 500 years ago. But that movement was not perfect either. There were some things that have still not been completely restored. Because some of the lies that were inherited from the Catholic Church have not been completely expunged. Some of the Mamay teachings have been kept in and not identified yet. Some of the ones we discussed in this very video, including the anti-Semitism, including the hatred for the Sabbath or the biblical feast days, or anything that seems to look a little bit Jewish, even if it's a biblical commandment. I want to also make it clear that the things that we've discussed in this video, they're not salvational issues. These are not the th things by which we are saved. These are things by which we worship. They are how we understand God, how we worship the Lord, how our relationship with the Lord goes. It is an expression of our love for him. That is our obedience. And so because we are saved by faith, 
it is not that we are not saved if we may not understand everything I have talked about in this video. And it does not mean that any of the great leaders who may you look up to who did not have these understandings, it does not mean that they weren't saved or that it doesn't even mean that they weren't good men of God. But we all have much to learn. We all have much to return to because we all have inherited lies to some degree. But the Messiah is restoring us back. Just like a piano that needs to be tuned multiple times before it is completely correct and accurate to the notes. So I want to submit to you the body of Christ is being tuned by the Father. The Reformation was one of those tunings. But the Father is busy with another one today. And this one is closer than ever to the return of the Messiah. And because of this, it's going to mean that those who allow themselves to be tuned will look like the Messiah more than ever if they allow themselves to be humbled and incline their ear to what he has to say, even if that means to turn the ear away from what men have said before. So to summarize this series, there are a few main reasons why the Jewish people struggle to believe in the Messiah today. It is due to anti-Semitism and anti-Christianity. Each movement spreading lies about each other. It is also because of Christianity's later denial of the obedience to key commandments in God's law. It is because of Judaism's denial that God could make a covenant that includes Gentiles or people who aren't Jews. It is also due to the formation of the Christ figure void of his true Jewish identity because of the lies spread within Judaism by leaders about the true Messiah and due to the change of days of worship. As you can see, we can certainly conclude one thing. No one was innocent. The separation between Judaism and Christianity is because of errors within Christianity and the people in that movement, as well as errors within Judaism and in that movement. Lies spread about each, lies spread about the Messiah, etc. So that's the bad news. But the good news is, is that God has given you and me what we have today. And you watching this video, he's equipping you with eyes to see, to be able to be, reach out to the, to, your, to the hands of your Jewish brothers and sisters, to show them who the Messiah truly is. And there is, this what I'm talking about is taking place. There is a revival taking place in Judaism today. We have more Jewish people that have come to faith in the last few years than in the last thousand years. We are seeing Jewish people seeing the Messiah in numbers like never before because believers are starting to put on the character of the Messiah in ways like never before and keeping the commandments like he did in showing love, compassion, and perhaps one of the most important elements by walking in the spirit, walking in miracles, power and love by going ahead and showing the great commission to our Jewish brothers and sisters. In fact, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. When we walk like our Messiah and all that he was, the keeping of the truth and the walking out of the spirit, that means keeping a Sabbath, that means keeping the biblical feast days, that mean eat, means eating like our Messiah did, then we'll be able to be a witness of truth. And when we cause our demons and heal the sick and go and walk in the spirit through prophecy, etc., we'll be uh, walking like him and how he did in the spirit and in power. So may this drive you more in the pursuit of walking like your Messiah did in spirit and truth. I hope that this teaching has blessed you. Consider sharing it with your friends and family to let them see 
how we are to perceive our Jewish brothers and sisters and to let us understand what the history really is so we can repair the breach because that's what the Messiah came to do and is sending us to go out and do. I hope that this teaching has blessed you. Subscribe to this channel for more just like this one. Like this video, share it with your friends. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Shalom.